In a prior video, I ranked the efficacy of different MS disease modifying therapies based on head-to-head -head trials and I ranked hematopoietic stem cell transplant number one and Lemtrada number two. You can take a look if you want, but a recent publication in SAGE seems to vindicate my rankings as an Italian group shows three patients who failed with Lemtrada but succeeded with hematopoietic stem cell transplant. We'll look at these three cases in detail showing their MRI scans and talking about a few of the limitations of this publication. Let's have some fun. My name is Brandon Bieber and I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications and if you appreciate this video please click like. Now I'm not going to go into detail about hematopoietic stem cell transplant. I have a dedicated video on that but basically it's not the stem cells but rather the chemotherapy that makes it effective. And the way it works is that after the bone marrow is harvested strong chemotherapy drugs are given to wipe out the immune system and you can't exactly walk around with no immune system so you're given the transplant to replenish your immune system and the effect is to essentially reboot the immune system and decrease inflammation and hope that the new immune system isn't prone to attacking the nervous system and this is a proven effective treatment and many people have reported long-term or indefinite remission after this treatment. Now hematopoietic stem cell transplant isn't really a single treatment because there are all kinds of different conditioning regimens and the conditioning regimen is the combination of drugs used to deplete the immune system and that really determines the efficacy and safety of hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And of course every center that does it has, uses different treatments and has different levels of experience but in this Italian center they use BEAM plus ATG and BEAM is an acronym standing for four different drugs that interfere interfere with DNA synthesis and these are classic chemotherapy drugs and they include BCNU or carmustine, etoposide, cytosine or ribonucide, melphalan and again these are drugs that interfere with DNA synthesis in rapidly dividing cells and so they weaken the immune system but also have traditional chemotherapy side effects such as hair loss, nausea, infertility, weakening of the immune system and so forth and also they include ATG or antithymocyte globulin and these are antibodies against thymocyte sites a type of white blood cell and this slide just shows some of the different conditioning regimens if you want to learn more about it go ahead and click on the link above about hematopoietic stem cell transplant and MS in general but basically beam plus ATG isn't the strongest regimen which usually includes busulfan which is very toxic but beam plus ATG is one of the stronger regimens definitely myeloablative meaning it doesn't just kill lymphocytes but also myelocytes so it essentially profoundly weakens the entire immune system some of of the safer regimens include just cyclophosphamide or cytoxan alone which kind of spares the myelocytes and it's not as dangerous but unfortunately not as effective. So let's take a look at these three cases and I'm going to refer to a measure of disability in MS used in clinical trials called the EDSS or Expanded Disability Status Scale and I have a separate video on it if you want to take a look but basically it's a 0 to 10 scale where 0 means no disability, 2 to 3 could be considered mild disability, 4 could be considered mild moderate disability. At EDSS 6, a cane is required to walk 100 meters, and at EDSS 6.5, a walker is needed. So we'll start with a 27-year-old woman with relapsing remitting MS, and she had the disease for six years and was previously treated with interferons and Tysabri, and she had a postpartum relapse, meaning a relapse after delivering a child, and then was treated with Lemtrada in September in 2016, and at the time of her treatment, she had an EDSS of 3, so more like mild to moderate disability might be imperceptible to a casual observer. But four months after treatment with Lemtrada, she had a very severe relapse with 30 gadolinium positive or enhancing lesions and had an EDSS of 7.5. So she was using a wheelchair and could only walk a few steps. And she was treated with steroids, intravenous methylprednisolone, 15 grams. This is a very high dose. Usually we would give one gram for three to five days, so only three to five grams total, but she was treated continuously essentially because she didn't improve, so a very high amount of steroids and plasma exchange, and she didn't improve. However, she was treated with hematopoietic stem cell transplant, BEAM plus ATG, and improved dramatically, and her EDSS went from 7.5 to 2. In other words, from using a wheelchair and could only walk a few steps to mild disability, so a tremendous response. Now, she did have some complications. She had sepsis or disseminated infection with E. coli, but was treated with antibiotics and improved. 
And one year later, she actually had something called aseptic necrosis of the femoral head, which is damage to the bone at the hip. And this can be a complication of steroids or other immunosuppressive drugs. And the authors speculate that it may have actually been due to the steroids and not due to the beam plus ATG. But unfortunately, she did have to have joint surgery on both hips. But she was followed up for 30 months and was doing well and was perfectly stable. Her results on MRI scans were remarkable. Take a look at her before after T2 flare axial MRI. You can see she had extensive lesions in the corpus callosum and subcortical white matter that are virtually all gone. And on the T1 enhanced images, look at all of these enhancing lesions all gone on the follow-up scan. Click like if you're impressed by those MRI results. This next woman had MS from a very young age, starting at age 14 and was 24 at the start of this study. And she was diagnosed with secondary progressive MS, which is a little bit unusual for a 24-year-old with multiple gadolinium-enhancing lesions on MRI, but who am I to question their diagnosis? Anyway, she was treated with Tysabri and interferons and had breakthrough disease and was started on Lemtrada in March 2015 and received a second course in January 2016 and a third course in March 2017, but had continued relapses and then progressive decline and had an EDSS of 5.5, which means she could walk more than 100 meters, but less than 200 meters without an assistive device and had had multiple new MRI lesions. She received hematopoietic stem cell transplant, again with BEAM and ATG, two years after the last Lemtrada dose. She did have some complications. She had enterococcus fecalis urinary tract infection sepsis. I'm not sure how severe it was, but she improved after antibiotics. She also had grade one oral mucositis, which is mild irritation of the mouth membranes. And she also, based on laboratory tests, had some activation of certain viruses, including CMV or cytomegalovirus, and an EBV or Epstein-Barr virus, but she had no clinical symptoms from this, and she overall improved. Her EDSS went from 5.5 to 4.5, which means she could walk more than 300 meters. So it wasn't a dramatic, dramatic improvement, but she could definitely walk further, and at seven months follow-up, she was completely stable. Her MRI scans also improved. You can see her T2 flare MRIs didn't really show a lot of lesions in general, presumably because most of her gait problems were more due to spinal cord injury, but she did have a reduction and lesions. If you look at her images with contrast, for whatever reason, the post image after hematopoietic stem cell transplant really has a terrible timing of the injection. You can't see any of the blood vessels, so I wouldn't make too much of this. Now, the next woman is a 39-year-old woman with secondary progressive MS who had MS for 15 years and was previously treated with interferons and Tysabri. She stopped Tysabri because she was afraid of PML and changed to Jelenia. However, she started Lemtrada in January in 2017 because she had new MRI lesions while taking Jelenia and took the second course of Lemtrada in January in 2018. However, on Lemtrada, she had two relapses involving the cord and a polysymptomatic relapse, meaning she had a relapse involving multiple symptoms due to multiple areas of injury and had an EDSS of six, meaning she required a cane to walk 100 meters. She was treated again with hematopoietic stem cell transplant. She did have a complication of pneumonia and had activation of Epstein-Barr virus, but no symptoms due to this, and she improved dramatically from an EDSS of 6 to only 2.5, so from using a cane to mild disability. And I should clarify that the EDSS 6 wasn't her baseline disability, it was her disability after she had the attacks on the spinal cord. But she was doing well and was stable after seven months of follow-up. Now, if you look at her flare scans, there's not a big change because she had a lot of lesions and atrophy at baseline, but if you look at her exam with contrast, you can see multiple gadolinium and enhancing lesions disappeared after the hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So those are three cases where Lemtrada failed miserably, but BEAM plus ATG was remarkably successful despite the infectious complications. So what exactly is going on here? Is hematopoietic stem cell transplant just better than Lemtrada? So I think the answer is yes, but with a caveat. The thing you should take note of is that it's just not that common for Lemtrada to perform so poorly. There could have been hundreds of people at this Italian center retrieving Lemtrada, only a few of them who didn't do well, as in these three cases. The thing is that Lemtrada is generally a highly effective medication. It's not common for people to have severe relapses and many new active gadolinium-enhancing lesions immediately after taking it. But it does happen sometimes, and I think 
think what's happening here is that some people with Lymtrata can get secondary autoimmune diseases. And of course, this is a very well-known side effect. Most commonly, people get thyroiditis. And what's happening is that we think that the B lymphocytes, a subclass of white blood cells that makes antibodies, are sort of repopulating before the T regulatory cells are fully functioning. So the immune system can sort of come back abnormally, and most commonly you get antibodies against the thyroid, and that is generally speaking easily treatable. There are some other rare autoimmune diseases that have been reported, for instance, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura where the antibodies attack the platelets and you get bleeding problems which can happen with Lymtrata as well but in very rare cases and I'll put a few references up you can actually get an immune attack against the nervous system essentially a rebound of multiple sclerosis after taking Lymtrata it's not very common but it's definitely been reported and I think that's what's happening in these three cases Furthermore, I don't think anything really unusual is happening here. While it may seem impressive that these patients had a massive improvement after receiving hematopoietic stem cell transplant, that's actually very common after having severe attacks with multiple enhancing lesions and happens all the time. And again, it's not because of the stem cells and potentially these patients could have gotten better with other therapies such as intravenous cytoxan without stem cells. That being said, I stand by my position that hematopoietic stem cell transplant, particularly with the stronger conditioning regimens, is likely the most efficacious disease-modifying therapy for MS. But I'd like to know, what do you think about these three cases? Do you agree? Do you disagree? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?